Friday afternoon. We've locked the door because I'm refreshing the vote numbers on Pennsylvania and Georgia every 20 seconds, so I can't possibly expect to do any actual work right now. And also because it's time for another edition of our weekly podcast, Tales from the Brown Desk. I'm Jake Rigney of Rigney Law, LLC. With me as usual is my law partner, wife, and the lady who went vegetarian just in time to avoid cooking me that yummy Thanksgiving turkey I want, Cassie Rigney. Terry Ulm is our host, manager, topic selector, floor demand monitor, email screener, and the only genuine human who's ever actually appeared on the show. Friendly reminder, Tales from the Brown Desk is a free-flowing conversation involving two foul-mouthed attorneys. It may include graphic descriptions of sexual activity, violence, and very loud protests about the stupid memes that people send out, saying that people are going to hand out drugs for Halloween candy. That's just stupid. People who use drugs don't give their drugs away to kids. People had to go through a somewhat harrowing process of cultivating a relationship with a drug dealer, getting the money to purchase the drugs, buying the drugs from some paranoid dude that might or might not also be on drugs, and who also might or might not kill you. Also, most drug users loathe themselves for using drugs, but can't stop because they're so addicted that it overcomes their instincts of self-preservation. They aren't trying to get random neighborhood kids into the same mess they got themselves into. That's stupid. Stop sharing that meme. (sighs) This podcast may not be suitable for children, drug users, job recruiters, or the people that could interview us to do regular jobs after the second wave of the coronavirus demolishes our economy. Here's Terry. Hello, everyone. Hi, Jake. How are you today? Oh, I'm not feeling too well, Uh, so Cassie's going to do a lot of talking today. Oh, good. Hi, Cassie. How are you? Hi, Terry. I'm fine. Good. So in the last episode of Tales from the Brown Desk, we talked about theft, burglary, and robbery. We also talked about a pharmaceutical company that recently pled guilty to criminal charges. This week, we're going to talk about drugs, more specifically the possession of drugs in Indiana, And we're also going to touch on the role of a criminal defense attorney. But before we begin, we have two listener questions. Two listener questions. Wow. Thank you, listeners. That's awesome. Thank you for making our job easier. Give us free content, suckers. (laughs) So the first question comes from a listener who wants to remain anonymous. Unacceptable. I demand their name (laughs) and their location. A. A. (laughs) I'm kidding. Their question is... If you know a crime happened, do you have an obligation to report it? And if you don't, can you get in trouble? There's only one crime that you'd be required to report, and that's child abuse. Other than that, no. Yeah, you do have to report child abuse. Um, And it's I think it's a misdemeanor if you don't report it. And the statute of limitations kind of never actually starts running on it either because of some weird rules regarding it. So it's important if somebody uh, reports... Having been abused as a child, you're required to report that. Otherwise, uh, there's no obligation for you to report. Although generally, like generally good people report crimes when they see them. Yeah, I think this I think this came around because when it comes to child abuse, people in society have a tendency if they see something questionable, you know, at least historically had left that to the family. And I I suspect that this law came about because they want people to turn information over to authorities to follow up and not having lay people making decisions. So hopefully if if a child needs some help that, that it can get there. Our next listener question comes from a guy that goes by the name of B. B resides here in Indianapolis and he wants to know, Is it illegal to install spy software on someone else's phone? I don't know. The answer is, so I'm not certain, as you can tell, because I just said I don't know. (laughs) Probably. It is probably illegal. My gut tells me that it is illegal to do that. (laughs) And I know there are some some computer hacker laws in Indiana, um, and that would probably qualify, but Computers are the kind of thing where it's very fact specific and sort of depends on how it all happened. But that's that's probably illegal. And now we're going to move on to the topics of the day. And we're going to start with drug possession. What is the definition of possession? Well, in Indiana, there's two types of possession. There's actual and constructive possession. Actual, I don't have that. I no longer have actual committed to memory. I mean, it's under your direct 
physical control. I don't think that's the actual words that uh, the law uses, but but it's in your pocket, it's in your hand. Um, and then we have constructive possession. And that kind of possession means that, you know, it, it's not on your person, but they look to the surrounding circumstances. They look to, you know, is it in plain view? Is it within your arm span? Is is it immediately apparent to be contraband? Who else has access to that, that space? Um, is it commingled with the person's other personal property? Are there statements or actions by the person surrounding that item that tend to indicate knowledge? She's pretty smart, isn't she? She is. Now, how would the state prove constructive possession? Well, and this is where it comes down and everyone, people call in their age just like it is what it is. And no, the finder of fact would decide. I mean, this is, there's two sides to every story. So oftentimes, let's say, you know, drugs are found inside a vehicle that, that the accused is driving. You know, the things, you know, you go to trial and the, the, the pieces of evidence that would be put in front of the jury, who's the car registered to? Uh, were there any movements by the driver, the accused, t- towards the location of the item? Was it in plain view? Was it easily visible or was it uh, hidden somewhere? What were the circumstances of that? Um, was there other personal property there? Um, you know, Was there anybody else in the car? And then the person who decides that, is that enough, is the finder of fact. Um, that's how you prove it. And there's no, I mean, these things, there's not a check three of the seven you know in some circ in some cases one might be enough in other cases you may have six and the person may be found not guilty if it was you know how do they prove it i mean that's that's what they do they tell the story and they lay the circumstances down and the question is that enough are you firmly convinced that that person possessed it yeah there, it reminds me of a couple of common misconceptions that i hear fairly often when talking to folks. One is a lot of people don't realize this, but two different people can possess the same drugs at the same time. Interesting. Um, right. You would think that if, you know, if I'm possessing it, then you aren't. Right. Right. But that's not how it works under the law. Um, if, if it was a joint we're passing around, I understand, but. Right. Well, look, if we're in a, a drug dealing conspiracy together and one of us has got the cocaine and not the other one, it doesn't matter. We're really still both exerting control over it. So we're both possessing it. And it's the same if it's like a joint we're all smoking. Like it doesn't matter whose hand it is when the police kick the door in. If we're sitting around a table smoking a joint, then we're both possessing the marijuana regardless. Um, another thing is that people often confuse possession with ownership. And that is not the same. Um, It's not nine-tenths of the law? (laughs) (laughs) I don't know if it's nine-tenths of the law or not. Um, There's no law that says that, by the way. That's just something somebody that didn't have a law degree said. But I can possess a thing even if I don't own it. How? If Cassie has a gun... I possess her mask now. Right. So, <laughs> and I'm very sorry. Uh, I after I tossed that to you, I realized, oh my god, I just threw the, the, the pilgrim blanket, right? right. Like the smallpox blanket, yeah, the small pox pilgrim pox blanket. blanket. What the so f- are you talking about? I was about? trying to. That was exactly what I was thinking about the pilgrims oh did to the Indians. So let me explain the hate crime that I just saw. You guys realize we're not on TV, right? <laughs> so I nobody else can see what you just did. So while I'm trying to explain how you can possess something without owning it, Cassie takes her mask and throws it at Terry. That has a skull on it, mind you. (laughs) Right. The mask she's been breathing in all day. Um, (laughs) And then then Terry has it in her hand because she's like, oh, a mask just hit me. So that is Cassie's mask. Cassie owns it, but you were possessing it there for a moment. Just long enough to sue us over it later. (laughs) Uh, And... And then we went on to make some very culturally inappropriate jokes about smallpox and Indians. And that was awesome, too. So now we're all back up to speed. <laughs> well, was it not clear that I think that that was a bad thing? I, I'm joking. Dude. Okay. I'm just, just making jokes. Um, anyhow, so yeah, ownership and possession are different. And now you know that. <laughs> I do. Well, and I mean, that's the thing. Um, anything. I mean, yeah. But ownership comes in like you can intend to possess. That's still mine. I'm probably still in possession of it, of it um, even though you have it, even th- because it's mine. Yeah, that was the thing you were both possessing at the same time there for a moment. And then as soon as you gave it back to her, only she possessed it again. But she could see it. It was right there. She has the ability to reach out and control it, and she intends to. 
Um, so she was still possessing it even after she threw it at you. It's always funny. People think you know, there's these, you know, the Dukes of Hazard start it. You know, if you could make it past that state line, there's this magic line. If you make it and it's a free for all and people and, like And to... it was actually the county line. Oh, it wasn't the even line. the state line. Okay. Like Dukes of Hazard was so stupid <laughs> <laughs> that it was literally like if you can just get across the line into the next county, then the cops can't chase you. That is so dumb. That is not true. Uh, you, that will you will not escape the police if you manage to make it to the county line. There, no. there is virtually nothing in the law that actually works that way. But yeah, people, I, you know, leaving possessions in somebody else's car and coming in and say it's mine, but I don't own it. That's not what we look at. That doesn't. The fact that it is owned by somebody else is one thing to consider, but it's certainly not a controlling factor. Now, are drugs considered the same thing as a controlled substance? Are those words used interchangeably? Yeah. um, You know, any drug is ultimately a controlled substance. And then how would you define a controlled substance? Just a drug? No, I mean, the controlled substances, the con- it is dictated by the control, and that's the government controlling it. Um, if it is a substance controlled by the government, then it's a controlled substance. Right. Any, any substance where the government has passed a regulation to control its possession, use, or prescription is a controlled substance. So heroin, but also Viagra. Anything you need a prescription from a doctor for is also a controlled substance, along with lots of things that you can't get from a doctor, like cocaine. Now, is drug possession a felony or a misdemeanor? And does the type of charge depend on the type of drug and the amount of drug? I hardly ever saw, even as a drug prosecutor, legend drugs. I think those are probably misdemeanors. Those are things you couldn't get high on, um, but they would be, con- you know, maybe a prescription that wasn't to you, but not something, again, that you would get high on. Um, the only misdemeanor possession is marijuana. Everything else is felonies, and it starts low and goes up depending on the weight. Out of the controlled substances, which is the worst to have as far as charges coming at you? Anything that's considered a Schedule 1 are the worst. Can you tell me some examples of a Scheduled 1 substance that, like, other people would know? Oh, cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine. I mean, the big ones. I mean, the big ones are are that. The thing that's out of whack is that they also have marijuana is still categorized as a Schedule 1, which is is ridiculous. Um, But all the other ones. And alcohol is not... Is that a controlled substance? Technically it is because we control who can purchase it. Right. But but it's not a Schedule 1 substance. Now, is being in possession of someone else's prescription a crime? Maybe. It is if you stole it. What if they gave it to me? (laughs) What if they gave it to Chad, not, not me? Well, I mean, this is where you have to look in the circumstances, everyone, because we know I could go pick up Grandma's pain meds and transport them back to her and if I got traffic stopped um, those are not my drugs Um, but I mean this is where discretion comes in I think a hard reading of the law no I'm not supposed to there's a legitimate basis and my intention was not to consume it so I mean you look at it I mean the thing is you can or is it just one pill in your pocket do you got it in a bunch of little jewelry bags I mean they're they're charging people who have their drugs in user or I guess abuser looking circumstances. Right. I, I mean, I, if I picked up grandma's pain pills and took them home uh, and got stopped in theory, I could be charged with a crime for that. I've never seen anyone actually get charged with a crime for that. If you're going to go pick up grandma's pain pills and they'll give them to you, just don't open them. Right. You don't open even the outer package, much less the inner package. Right. And then if they say, well, why do you have pain pills? You say, well, I'm taking them to grandma. Um, and I've never seen anyone get charged in that situation, and I don't think Cassie has either. Could they? Yeah. Are all police out to charge everything they find? No, they're not. And I don't think they've ever. I don't think I've ever seen anyone get charged like that. Has it happened? I, I bet it has. Probably somewhere in the country. Now, still, still on prescriptions here. Let's say this is a a controlled drug, and somebody has prescribed it, and it expires. Can you be charged with a drug crime 
if you have a expired prescription? No, I mean it's still lawfully. I mean it was still lawfully dispensed to you. So the fact that it's expired, I mean, the expiration date doesn't have anything. That has to do with the uh, quality of the production and like your expectation of what you're getting, you know, when they put that use by date or, you know, the quality is guaranteed here. That has absolutely no connection to the lawfulness of its possession. Can possession of a drug result in a driver's license suspension? It, it used to. Um, it used to be that if you got caught with a controlled substance or marijuana in your car, they could also suspend your driver's license. But they did away with that law a few years ago. Every now and then I still see it on old driving records um, when we're going back through people's records from the aughts and the 90s and stuff. Um, but they do not typically issue new suspensions these days for those type of offenses. Although you have to remember exactly what question you asked. So the answer is if you get caught with a DUI, yes, they do suspend your license. Um, But if they just pull you over possessing drugs, I don't think they suspend your license anymore for that. And now we're going to touch on paraphernalia. I assume those charges often accompanied with drug possession charges. What what's the definition of paraphernalia? It's. I don't know if they, it's a tool or a utensil used to introduce a controlled substance into one's body. Yeah, the statute actually, I think, says any device, just anything, basically. So it could be like a straw. If you're going to use it to smoke meth, yeah, then it's paraphernalia. Or snort cocaine. Yeah, so a dollar (laughs) bill can be paraphernalia. Wow, a dollar bill could be. Sure. A properly tooled apple. Right. (laughs) Um. What's the uh, toilet paper roll? Yeah, that, that you, that's paraphernalia if you uh, if you know how to use it. <laughs> oh, that 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 draws. Okay, so um, I have a friend of mine who has uh, teenagers in in his home, and uh, one of them was uh, caught smoking marijuana, and uh, in the uh, interrogation regarding this, and like you know, it's like I could obviously smell it, and well, they tried to do the toilet paper roll, but they were just blowing it through the tube in the middle of the roll like they didn't shove the dryer sheet. No. <laughs> no. Well, they, they were just blowing it through a tube. And I think, I, I want to say it was in the morning or sometime because he's just working in the house and this horrible smell of pot like overcomes the thing. It's like, what's going on? For, yeah, for those of you who don't know, they're... There are two different two different ways you can use the toilet paper roll. One is you can actually use it to make a little makeshift pipe with some, usually with some aluminum foil, um, and then use that to smoke the marijuana. Or for other enterprising smokers who already have those apparatuses but are worried about the smell, you can put a dryer sheet inside a toilet paper roll and blow the smoke out through the toilet paper roll and the dryer sheet, and the smell gets erased by the dryer sheet and it just smells like you were doing laundry and that that'll fool some people but you have to actually do that you have to put the dryer sheet in the roll <laughs> yeah well, I, you know they're teenager you know senior in high school or something you know yeah you live and learn you do hopefully no one got arrested Oh, no, no one got arrested. Yeah, that's good. No one should get arrested. That's a lecture is what you should get out of that. Well, that fo- the follow-up, you know, I grew up in Michigan. That was a, a Michigan story. You know, it's something about because uh, the smoking age in Michigan is like 21, but they legalized marijuana. So, like, if you're 19, quick throw out the cigarette, light a joint because <laughs> you could recreational smoke. but At, like, so 18, so. but not. The, yeah, that was the, the meme I saw. I mean, I don't I assume that it's 18. Now, in regards to the penalties for drug possession charges, what's like the stiffest penalty you've ever seen? Well, I mean, you can go to prison. For how long? It depends on whatever level the charge is. 40 years. 40 years? 40 to 30. No one's getting the death penalty, right? No. Okay, or spending life in prison. No, and what I was describing was dealing, too. Um Possession might stop at a four. It might, but then, you know, if you end up, if they added the habitual on to you or mm, something, you yeah. can start getting longer. Yeah. Um, I 32. Mean, 32. 32 with a level four plus the habitual. 32 do 
24. And then what about the penalties for possession drug paraphernalia? I'm assuming that is less than actually possession the drug itself, but I don't know. Is it the highest? I haven't, uh, to be honest, I haven't actually had one of those cases, at least not as a lead charge since earlier in my prosecution career. Can it still be advanced to a D felony with a prior? I don't, I don't think so. Um, once upon a time, maybe it could. But these days, I think that doesn't go above a misdemeanor. Um, you know, we just don't see a lot of paraphernalia cases anymore, to be honest. Um, and I don't, I don't really know why that is either. It might just be because they reduced the penalty so much that, like, they don't care about charging it anymore. Well, I wonder with the, uh, I mean, usually when I see it from an evidence standpoint, if, if the paraphernalia is a syringe... That's like hazardous waste, so oh, they're not yeah. they're not going to want to... I forgot about that. Uh, That's a level six, possession of a syringe. So this possession of the syringe is interesting, considering that could be um, a crime. Aren't there like places you can go in Indiana and get new syringes or turn your syringes in? Yes, but they don't ask you what you're going to do with it. Well, that's where, I mean, it's just, and there are lawful reasons for people to uh, possess syringes. And this is where you look to the circumstances. And and as much as uh, it, it pains drug users to, to hear this, it is fairly easy for a non-drug user to identify a, a user versus a diabetic. Um, I think that there are, are users of heavy drugs and intravenous drugs who have a tendency to think that people don't get it and don't see it. And I don't think there's anything that is a casual, you know, intravenous drug user. And, uh, you know, you know, you always get, well, anybody could have it. Well, you look like a fucking doper man. (laughs) Classic (laughs) advice from Cassie. You look like a doper man. (laughs) Well, I'm going to give it to you straight, right? Brutally honest. That's the kind of lawyer you want. Yes. What are some possible defenses to drug possession charges? I don't own it. Not my pants. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I had to throw that out there. That, that, that's that been a running joke for it forever. Um, if it's on your person, it can be difficult. Um, but that's where I think Lindsay Lohan was the first one who made national headlines with the <laughs> they're not my pants <laughs> defense. Uh, but when it comes to constructive possession, there's a lot of room to work there. Because as I laid it out, the classic thing is you're driving in a car and there's something that's not in there. Is it your car? is it not your car? Um, And there seem to be a lot of people who drive cars that do not belong to them. And the state always wants to be like, well, it was in there. It was on the floor. The driver's side was just like, if you've ever borrowed someone's car, did you ever search it? No. And unless it was pristine, you wouldn't, you wouldn't take note of any particular item. Right. The last, the last drug trial I did was a constructive possession case and it's over. They can't, he was found not guilty. So there's no reason not to talk about it. And he, uh, and, and that was exactly what happened. There was a tub of um, marijuana in a Tupperware container under the passenger chair of the uh, the car, and the passenger in the car got charged with possessing it. And our argument was, I mean, it's not his car. He didn't look under the seat. He doesn't know what's in there. And the judge found there was reasonable doubt on that and found him not guilty. Nice. Yeah, I usually don't look under people's seats when I get in their cars. Just make sure I won't get charged with crime. That's, it, that'd be odd. It'd be kind of rude, right? wouldn't it? Like, I'm going to go, I need, because then, like, if you're a passenger, you can get charged with what's in the glove box, too, because it's right there in front of you, right? So now I got to look through your glove box and under your, and in all the cons. Like, no, you don't do that. You're just thankful you got a ride. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, how long does the typical drug case last? None of them are typical. (laughs) Um, Right. You know, I mean, I would say the length of any given case, and I wouldn't say necessarily, I mean, I guess murders last longer, child molests, um, those things. But I mean, drug possession, generally, they're not that complicated. I mean, six months, I don't know, four to eight months. So they move along pretty fast. Yeah. I mean, most of these things shouldn't be taking a year. I mean, anyway. Yeah, the, the the bigger slowdown is is the court, and that's not a criticism of the court. There's just, in Marion County in particular, they have way too many cases um, in their drug courts, and now they've done away with their drug courts, so it's all getting spread back out, but there's just too many cases for the system. Um, and so the, the bigger slowdown 
especially if you have a public defender, is getting everyone ready. The case shouldn't take that long, but finding a courtroom and a judge and two attorneys who are all ready to do it turns into the challenge when they're all dealing with, you know, 10,000 cases a year. Now we're going to move on to our next top, the role of a criminal defense attorney. And I kind of wanted to talk about this just to clear up some misconceptions because I feel that a lot of people think that criminal defense attorneys come with these superpowers that they can stop the cops and tell the court and just do things that it's just not possible for them to do. So could you explain to the listeners what's the role of a criminal defense attorney and what powers do you have? Well, ultimately, we are a representative and an advocate. Hiring an attorney doesn't change your position with regards to the players. Uh, it doesn't change your power uh, with in regards to that triangle of power because it's you and the state are at the same footing or the opposing parties and then the judge is basically the referee you don't control the court's calendar just being a, a defense attorney you know I can't call up the cops and tell them stop your investigation you know I'm going to challenge that search warrant don't take that blood um, or you know the classic scene of you know somebody gets pulled off the street into an interrogation room and you know their family family gets wind of it and sends the attorney down to bust in and you know stop questioning my client like that that's not realistic that but it happens on tv all the time it does um and the cassie did leave out one important power that uh, all all defense attorneys have and that's um the x-ray vision <laughs> um because that's the thing that that we all have so that's awesome so we're an advocate and the role is to be represent that person. Um, you know, we are the ones that know how to maneuver the system in an appropriate way, um, in an efficient way and lawful way. Maneuver is a funny word. It's spelled funny too. <laughs> so yeah, you know, does that help? It does. Um, what can a, a defense attorney offer somebody that calls on a Saturday morning at 3.30 with a drama and they need an attorney? <laughs> like, what what can an attorney do for them in that moment? Well, we, we may have access to information that they didn't know where to find, right? Because we're familiar with the system, so we know how to look some things up that they might not be able to figure out on their own. Um. But beyond that, there's not a whole lot else we can do on a weekend when someone calls other than give them general information about how the system works and about what they can expect going forward. So if it's somebody who's never been in trouble before, they don't understand what's going to happen next, we can explain that to them and give them a little bit of comfort and solid you know, certainty about it. But we can't affect the investigation. There's not going to be any way for us to, you know... Um, prevent somebody from getting arrested um, on a case where we don't know anything about it. That kind of goes back to, I think I'd said, uh, as far as people like having disputes, legal disputes with the police on the street and the pro appropriate platform is the courtroom. And it's the same place there. Um, the police are going to do what they're going to do, but the, you know, there, there is a time and place to challenge those actions if they were wrong, but it's not, you know, an individual attorney busting into an investigation and making demands. Um, anything that we do, whether it be the state or the defense it all goes through the judge and from you know i mean uh, the, the police have access to ju judicial officers to get search warrants after hours but from a general standpoint you know there's no judge like i can't go f even file for an injunction which i wouldn't do as a criminal defense attorney but even a civil attorney um, there's not a judge to hear any kind of order like that on, on the weekend what about with jails? Do criminal defense attorneys have the ability to get someone out of jail faster or make the jail give someone medical attention? I'm tempted to say no, not at all, but that's not entirely true. Sometimes we can do a little bit to help, but it, typically the only time that's going to happen is if there's been some serious mistake. And even then, sometimes they don't listen to us. I had a client who got held for too long and they just wouldn't let him go. And that's just kind of how can you sweet talk? And that says, you know, your ability to persuade the people would also, same as negotiations, it depends what, what, what range of flexibility does the person answering the other end have. 
it's when people, you know, when people get those delays, our role in the court, all the court is going to tell the jail to do is to release you. The rest of it's on the court or on the jail, and, and they're not going to come back. If it's not getting fast enough, the court's not going to come in and micromanage your process out, or at least a cr- criminal court's not going to. Right, and you can't, even if you get a lawyer to try to work on it and help you, uh, they're not going to solve the problem usually in two hours. Um, you know, typically that's the kind of thing where eventually I get a hold of somebody who um, can you know, address my problem. One time I had a client who was suffering from some pretty obvious physical problems when he was in the jail. And it wasn't, I don't mean like he was saying he had chest pain. I mean, I could see his toe and it looked like the size of his head. It was gross. Like his, his foot is messed up. You guys just look at it. (laughs) Like in that situation, you know, I helped a little, I, I went to a deputy and was like, look, you guys got to find somebody to do something about this. Um, and I'm documenting this, and if they end up suing you, I'll end up being a witness. You know, it, you don't threaten them like that, but you just make it clear, like, this is not okay. You guys need to do something about it. But even then, I didn't. You know, it's not like we got that fixed overnight. It still took days or weeks. Um, and I don't, to be honest, I don't think the jail ever did satisfactorily resolve that issue. I just got him out eventually um, so that he could go see... Uh, a real doctor. I, I was... I hesitated before I said real doctor because they probably have a real doctor, yeah. but they've probably got one real doctor and 2,000 people, and I'm sure he's not really paying that much attention. Now, how about with um, parole officers and probation officers? What power do you guys have over them? None. <laughs> I mean, we're not their bosses. I mean, they, we work when I talk to, to p- potential tell people I'm a criminal defense attorney. My arena is the criminal courtroom. They do not. Get, I mean, think about it from a practical standpoint. <laughs> you think somebody coming out of the blue trying to tell you what's what? Is that going to work? Is it even going to be a benefit? Like people urge me to go like call and like push people. Just in my experience, those people who don't want their their power challenged you know challenging them when you have no footing only gets you know there's more likely to be harder on you to work more slowly on the things that they're doing um you know these people you know i feel like yeah like they think we have these capes and people are shaking in their boots when you say in defense attorney and i'll tell you law enforcement they do not they're not shaking in their boots when a defense attorney calls yeah it depends on what you need Right. Um, If you if you need information, if you need to understand what's going on, sometimes you can get them to talk to you about that or you can look things up that the people that the general public can't get a hold of to figure that out. But um, you certainly cannot email them over the weekend threatening to sue them and expect to get anything out of them about that. That's that's just not a thing that's ever going to happen. They're they're not afraid of that. Um, For the most part, the state's going to have immunity anyway. And parole is even more like that. We are going to now cut to a short commercial break. And when we come back, we will bring you the latest Florida Man news. Today's update on Florida Man is brought to you by Hand Sanitizer. Do you need to clean the Rona off your hands while also reminding yourself of a $4 fifth of vodka you drank in college? If so, you should try Hand Sanitizer. I feel really safe knowing that my daughter's hands are Rona free. It's a total bonus that 15 years from now when my daughter is in college, some 24-year-old Sigma Chi cocksmith can hand her a shot glass mist with Oxco Vodka and Liquid Roofie and she'll instinctively trust it because it reminds her of me. This message not actually brought to you by hand sanitizer. Seriously, that stuff's gross. So we have one story out of Florida to report on this week. Insider reports that Florida man pulled a gun on a driver who told him he had a small penis. (laughs) I've heard of dumber reasons to pull a gun on somebody. Not not much dumber, but dumber. Yeah, so according to the police report, Florida man revved his Jeep engine while stopped in traffic, and another driver who was in the car in front of him got out of his vehicle to confront him. He said, you must have a small dick. 
what police said that's that, a solid burn that's a solid burn and totally reasonable behavior well and what florida man needs to understand just because that guy said it every single person in earshot of that rev was see- thinking the exact same <laughs> thing and any question that they had was removed when you pulled your gun out yeah police say it was then when florida man pulled out his smith and wesson handgun right Yep, he told police that he was trying to protect himself and he didn't know what the other person was going to do as he approached him. Florida man told police he did not have a concealed weapons permit and he was arrested on charges of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. What? Yep, carrying a concealed weapon. Okay. Dealing in stolen property. I'm not sure where that comes in. And a, <laughs> Did he try to sell him some rims <laughs> in the middle of this conversation? I suspect maybe after being arrested for the firearm, they searched his car. And found stolen something. Yeah. Maybe and, the gun was stolen. And a misdemeanor charge of driving without a valid driver's license. Uh, don't. <laughs> oh. yes. Cassie has explained this before. Don't commit two crimes at once. That guy was committing like three crimes. He had stolen stuff. Driving while suspended, okay. and then he then he pulls a gun on a dude <laughs> he has in a gun traffic. And a, he's not supposed to have a gun. He doesn't have a license. So you were just my, keep your mouth shut. Go wherever you're going, man. <laughs> but no, he's revving his engine, and then okay, well that started a problem. Now okay, sorry, mm-hmm, whatever. Right. Here's the <laughs> the difference between Florida man and I is uh, if I was driving on a suspended license with stolen stuff in my car and a gun I didn't have a license for. I would not be like, how dare you, sir, claim my penis is small. <laughs> I would be like, yep, sure is. Don't call the cops, okay? <laughs> like, instead, he's just like, hey, it's, you might as well just call the cops on yourself. I mean, it was the only way he could have been more certain he was going to jail. This man deserves zero sympathy. I have a question about this. Yeah. Let's say Florida man, instead of pulling out his handgun, he pulled uh, out his penis. Right. If he had, yeah, said, no, it isn't. Look. Is that a crime? Yes. <laughs> well, in Indiana, anyway. <laughs> I don't know how they get down in Florida, but in Indiana, pulling out your penis in public is also a crime. Is it a lesser crime? Yes. It is a lesser crime, crime than theft and aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Uh, typically, in Indiana, that's a crime called public nudity which is a C misdemeanor, I believe, uh, unless he t- unless he starts stroking it <laughs> for his own benefit or someone else's, and then it's an A misdemeanor. I think it's indecent exposure. Um, but yeah, that's, yeah, that's illegal. And that's all the time we have for today. All right. Thanks, Terry. And uh, thank you, dear listener, for listening to Tales from the Brown Desk. Please remember... While we may discuss legal issues and provide information regarding the law to our listeners, we do not intend to create an attorney-client relationship with any listener. Our advice may not be applicable to some legal issues. Please consult with an attorney you've hired to review your legal situation before you attempt to apply the things we have said to your case. Tales from the Brown Desk is produced by Rigney Law and edited by Terry Ulm. If you want to ask a listener a question, email Terry at T-E-R-I at RigneyLawIndy.com. And entitle your email, podcast question, and we'll read it on our next podcast. Give us new content for free. We have regular jobs, damn it. We cannot do this all on our own. Buzzsprout says this podcast will get 31 downloads. Hells yeah. More comebacks. All the comebacks are ours. We have many comebacks. Probably more comebacks than Donald Trump has. Because I'm thinking he's out of comebacks. I have app stopped promoting this podcast on my Facebook page, by the way, just so you guys know. Um, so that may be why our numbers have been sagging a little bit. Um, I've done that because this podcast is lame as hell because of me and also because Facebook is bad for my mental health. Our newest faraway listener is in Berlin, Germany. I have a Facebook friend who lives in Germany, but I don't think that's her. Maybe our Paris, France listener is passing us along to other Europeans That's how socialism works, right? First one person catches it and then it spreads. It's definitely how coronavirus works. Okay. Well, look, I'm a stupid American. I don't know how (laughs) anything works over there. The attorneys at Rigney Law do not comment on their current pending cases. Nothing we've said in this podcast is a comment on a case we're currently working on, even if your name is Chad or if you just chugged hand sanitizer this weekend because you ran out of Dark Eyes Vodka. Goodbye.